Has your world ever been turned upside down by events beyond your control? That's next on The Prophetic Connection. Our focus for this new season of The Prophetic Connection is the book of Daniel, a book that was written some 2,500 years ago. But it's an amazing story of the life of a young man who was born in Jerusalem, but taken from here as an exile, along with thousands of other exiles, and taken, in fact, to the land of Babylon. Daniel 1 opens with these words. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And he took the spoils of war. He took the sacred vessels from the temple that stood roughly where the golden dome is. He took those sacred vessels back to Babylon, but he took much more than that. He took the cream of Israeli youth, the young Jewish boys and girls, the children of promise, the future of Israel at that time. And here's the instruction he gives in verse 3 of Daniel 1. Then the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of his units, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans, another word for the Babylonians. Well, Daniel's story unfolds, but it's a story of prophetic dreams and visions. Now, why study this book today in the 21st century? Because the amazing thing about the book of Daniel is that it describes events that happened in history, and history proves those events came true according to the prophecies. But it also describes events at the end of days. In fact, Daniel is very much a parallel book for the book of Revelation. So we begin this exciting adventure, one chapter each episode, and we will unfold the mysteries of the Bible, but also the future yet to be. The Old Testament book of Daniel tells the story of a young prophet. But who was Daniel? And why were young Jewish men and women like him taken captive to Babylon? Jewish tradition says that Daniel was, as a young man, taken out of the land of Israel and brought to Babylon about 10 years before the destruction of the first temple. Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of Babylon, comes to Jerusalem and takes out the 10,000 best and brightest. And uh, Jewish tradition understands that he took out mostly the, the Torah scholars and the leadership to bring them to Babylon in advance, which at the time seemed like a disaster, but in hindsight actually worked out really well because then when the mass of Jews came to Babylon a decade later, the infrastructure was there. But he was one of the early arrivals along with other characters such as Mordechai, who is the hero in the story of the book of Esther. Were Daniel and his companions chosen because they showed unusual promise? Is it possible they were taken to Babylon because they had noble or even royal bloodlines? Or could it be that they were taken because the Babylonians wanted to weaken Israel's future by robbing her of those with the greatest potential for leadership? Daniel was a young man from the tribe of Judah, and he was from a royal family. He was a special young man, and he was accompanied by other uh, young men of Judah he was especially wise. He was full of understanding and revelation. Well, Daniel was among the young men of Israel who were taken into captivity in Babylon. And, uh, but he kind of rose to the top because he had, he had such good qualities. They were good looking, they were intelligent, they were uh, young men of understanding, and they'd been chosen by the uh, Babylonians for special service in the king's court 
So they went through three years of instruction and testing and uh, emerged as, as young leaders, but of course their names were changed to Babylonian names. History shows that as the Babylonian Empire grew and embraced new cultures, it was their common practice to choose the brightest and best young people from within these newly conquered cultures as trainees. This as a means of developing new and cross-cultural leadership across the vast and ever-expanding empire. Daniel and his companions were taken to Babylon because they wanted to, to bring in the people of Israel into their empire. And they were building a multicultural, multiracial, uh, international empire that uh, included people from all different regions. And they wanted the best uh, that they could find. And so they took the best of Israel into captivity. They didn't want Israel to be a threat to them. They wanted to really co-opt the Israelis and make them Babylonian. When Nebuchadnezzar had risen to power, he was conquering lands, he came to Israel, uh, he took over Israel. And in their pattern, they were taking the best of all the young men for his own service, for Nebuchadnezzar's own service in his, in his palace, in his kingdom. Daniel didn't go to Babylon of his own free will. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, they came, they destroyed Jerusalem. They took the people of Judah into exile. Daniel was one of those. He joined the rest of the exiles in the land of Babylon. They were doing a brain drain on the country and he was one of the up and coming talent. And he proves as he rises to, to power as a chief advisor to multiple emperors in Babylon, I guess they, they picked wisely in advance. But again, he was one of many people who was taken in advance uh, to basically, I mean, the Babylonians were interested sort of in making a kind of united colors of Benetton empire. That was their unique way of doing things, unlike people like the Persians who weren't interested in that. So they basically seem to have gone from place to place, taking out the best and the brightest they could get their hands on to bring them to Babylon to, I guess, make it a, a multicultural and very progressive in terms of, you know, intellectual, intellectual empire with a capital city that had the best and brightest from all over their empire. But why did Daniel and his companions who were about to be trained for service in the king's court risk their futures and their lives by refusing to eat the king's food? So why did Daniel in chapter one refuse with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to eat the uh, king's food? It wasn't kosher, <laughs> uh, basically. Meat has to be kosher, even wine has to be kosher. So uh, I, I, having someone who travels around the world a lot, I appreciate that point. I often end up in places where there's no kosher food. And these people are very spiritual, religious people, keeping with Jewish law. They didn't want to violate the, a basic tenet of Jewish life by e eating non-kosher food, which the danger of that is A, starvation, and B, being impolite. You know, not refusing hospitality is in the Middle East considered not such a nice thing. But they put, you know, God's law above any of that other stuff. If Daniel and his companions knew that refusing to eat the king's food could be seen as a direct insult to the king, and could lead to a death sentence. Why was this a risk they were willing to take? The word I would point to there in the text is the word defile. It says that Daniel refused or asked if he could refuse because he was, he was still uh, connected and submitted to, to those leaders and chief uh, advisors, but he asked to refuse the food based on a statement. He did not want to be defiled by the king's food. So for me, as I'm studying the, the words of the Old Testament and the food laws as they are given to the people of Israel, I can define defile by food in two ways. One, it could be that the food was not meeting the kosher requirements, meaning it was an unkosher, unholy type of food. Or number two, even if it was a kosher type of food, if that food had been sacrificed to idols, he would have needed to refuse that as to not defile himself either. So I see the word defile there and it leads me to think in two directions. Either it was an unkosher food element or the food itself had been sacrificed to an idol. Does this mean that their love for and devotion to the God of Israel was greater than their fear of death at the hands of the Babylonians? Daniel and his young companions really clung to their identity as the people of God. This was really, really important to them, even as exiles and uh, being co-opted into the Babylonian kingdom. They wanted to remain Jews. 
and it was important for them to maintain the laws and the traditions, the heritage of their fathers and to obey the commands of God, particularly when it came to the dietary restrictions. So even though they were offered the best food in the realm and the sitting at the king's table, they refused because of their identity and their desire to serve the God of heaven. As the book of Daniel unfolds, it becomes clear that this first test of Daniel's devotion to God would be followed by many more. Daniel's abiding faith and trust in God, however, allowed him to overcome each and every trial in turn, a journey of devotion that would lead eventually to the day when Jesus of Nazareth would look back at Daniel's life and remind his disciples of the things Daniel had prophesied. In fact, it was within the context of his own teaching about the distant future that Jesus called Daniel a prophet. Don't go away. After this short break, Dr. John Tweedy returns with his teaching. Today in the Middle East, Israel stands alone as the only true democracy and free country in the region. Yet even free countries struggle with poverty and people in their society that fall through the cracks. This is especially true in Israel, as they are surrounded by enemies and must focus much of their budget on security. But you can make a difference. Your one-time donation of $20 or more can change a life. By giving today, you will help feed the elderly and Holocaust survivors, build bomb shelters in vulnerable communities, and help children in these areas go to school. We really wish to thank you for all your support in the past and say that it was very, very helpful for us. We see you as our partners and we wish that you continue uh, with your support of the Sderot children. When you call today with your one-time gift, as a thank you, you will receive the bi-monthly newspaper Israel and Christians Today and the special documentary Seven Amazing Prophecies Fulfilled. Call or write today. As we begin our study of the book of Daniel, the obvious uh, questions, who was Daniel? And why is there a book bearing his name? Well, in a sense, the answers are in the book itself. We begin in chapter one, the very first verses. And of course, the context here is the attack on Jerusalem, Israel, by King, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the armies of Babylon sacked Jerusalem. So th this is the historical context that's mentioned here. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Actually, he did this more than once. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Of course, this was the judgment coming from the prophecies of Jeremiah, God's prophet with some of the articles of the house of God, meaning the sacred temple vessels, which he carried into the land of Shinar, the region of Babylon, to the house of his God. In other words, these were the victor's spoils, at least in his mind. And the taking of those sacred vessels would come back to haunt Babylon later on. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Now, we find as we read on that Daniel is one of these young people, probably a teenager, uh, when this happened. And the suggestion then is because they were, the Babylonians were taking the cream of Israel's young people to train them in the ways in the court of Babylon. So they took the children of promise, and why wouldn't they take children from noble families, even the royal family, because they would train them in their ways, and therefore there'd be no promising young people to rise up and restore the kingdom of Israel. So here's the description we're given, verse four. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans, another word generally for Babylon, the, the Babylonian peoples. Then watch this. Um, and the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time, 
they might serve before the king. An apprenticeship of three years in the court of Babylon before they'd even be ready to serve in the king's court. Now, here's where we get the names, and of course the name of Daniel. Now among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And if you look at the Hebrew meanings of those names, and I'll come to that later, uh, each of those names contains the name of the Almighty God of Israel. Now, how do we understand the book of Daniel? Well, it's not completely um, chronological. That's the first thing to understand. Most of it is, but there are a couple of chapters that are not in their proper chronological order, and they're placed where they are for a good reason. The first six chapters of the book cover history, essentially, while the second six chapters cover visions, in fact, prophetic visions of the future. So whoever arranged the book, presumably Daniel, um, arranged it this way because he's given, in many cases, first-person account of his experiences and therefore the, that occasion, the writing of the book. The other thing to understand is um, that there are, part of the book is written in Aramaic, which was the common language of the then world at that time. We know that Jesus spoke Aramaic but he also spoke Hebrew, and when he would be in the synagogue, he was reading the Hebrew scriptures, but the language was uh, Aramaic, and so we, the parallel today would be English. English is spoken the world over. People of various nations have their own individual language and dialects, but in a general sense, uh, English is the dominant language that is spoken, and so many children in schools all over the world realize that they need to learn English. So that's the way to think of uh, the reason the book is, is written this way, because some of it has to do with non-Jewish Gentile history. Others, parts of it are very specifically Hebrew history. And in fact, the, toward the end of the book, it's in Hebrew because it's the prophetic future of Israel, really, uh, that is being explained there. Well, who wrote this incredibly, if, you know what? Um, critics will say that um, Daniel couldn't have written the book because it's all too accurate. It describes history in advance, which is to say, so, whoever wrote this book is looking back at history, seeing the events that have already taken place, and therefore able to write them down. Yet, other scholars say, well, the style and the writing is clearly that of someone that lived in the fifth century, or sixth century rather, before Christ, which is more than 500 years before Jesus walked the green hills of Galilee. And you have to have your own interpretation for me. The book was written by Daniel. Why? Because, well, I have other reasons for saying so, and I will come to them. But God is not trying to deceive us with his holy word. So if we're told that this is Daniel's book, uh, then I believe it is Daniel's book, but not just because of that. Uh, I will tell you now that Jesus refers to Daniel the prophet. And if that's what Jesus says of Daniel, then I'm going to take what Jesus says as being the important thing. But there are other reasons that um, I believe that this is Daniel's book. And in fact, I'm standing on the west shore of the Dead Sea. To my right and out of camera view is the famous fortress of Masada. Uh, to my left, up the shore of the Dead Sea, past En Gedi, where King David hid from King Saul, and Saul's soldiers were scouring the canyons there looking for David. And even beyond that, we come to a place called Qumran. Qumran is known as the place where the Essenes lived. And they were a very religious sect who refused to live in the cities of Jerusalem because they considered, or the cities of Judah rather, they considered them to be totally corrupt. They didn't want to live among Judean society. They wanted to keep themselves apart. You know, in the 21st century, we have um, some groups uh, like that as well. We have the Amish, for example. And some, some parts of the Mennonite church that are more strict um, want to stay to the old ways. They want their children not to be corrupted by the society around them. So they live out of the cities in their own sort of country settings, very much like the Amish. You can think of the Essenes in that way. They were extremely religious. They lived by the letter of the law, the law of Moses, and they recorded the scriptures and they wrote them and kept recording them. And they lived just up here until the Romans swept through here and presumably destroyed the Essene community. But here's the thing. 
1947, as chance would have it, um, just before Israel was reestablished as a nation after 40, uh, nearly 2,000 years. But in 1948, the United Nations recognized Israel. But the year before, they found what were known as the Dead Sea Scrolls in caves up the coast from here. And those scrolls were written by the Essenes uh, in the century before Christ, presumably while Christ was ministering on earth, and in the century after Christ until the Romans obliterated them, certainly scattered them. And they hid the scrolls, the scriptures, in the caves that were later found in 1947. But among those scrolls, they found eight complete books of Daniel. Eight complete books of Daniel and many fragments. Now, they were not books as much as they were scrolls. But it says to us that the Essenes, who were very meticulous recorders of Scripture and copiers of Scripture, revered the book of Daniel enough that they were re-recording it. And they had to be very accurate. If they made one mistake, they threw the scroll away. Eight sets of the book of Daniel were found in the caves up the coast from here. Now, themes in Daniel. First six chapters cover 70 years of exile in Babylon that I said Jeremiah prophesied would happen. And the last six visions of the future and a prophetic timeline of events, some events that haven't even happened yet. But I want to go back to chapter one and, and something that happened. And I read it earlier where the king wanted the young men of Judah to eat his food. As Orthodox Jews, they could not do that. They would defile themselves, so they refused. And so, verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, the chief of the eunuchs knew that if they didn't eat, and looked malnourished when they were brought in before the king who's going to examine them, his head would be on the chopping block. So what to do? So Daniel has a conversation with him. In fact, he appeals to the, the chief of the eunuchs and he says to him in verse 12, please test your servants, meaning us, Jews, for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And lo and behold, at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, of course, the king. What happened then? I'll answer that after this short break. For many years now, C4I Canada and our partners have been there for Israel, especially during times of war and hardship. Because of this support, Israel's most vulnerable have been cared for by groups like the Jaffa Institute and others. The Jaffa Institute is an institute that deals with children at high risk in slum communities around Israel. Each year, organizations like the Jaffa Institute care for those in Israel who are unable to care for themselves. And this is all possible because of people like you. We'd like to thank C4I and all the partners around the world for their support and love and blessing on the Jaffa Institute. With your monthly support of $20 or more, you are making a real difference in the lives of Israel's most needy. And when you become a monthly supporter, you will receive the bi-monthly newspaper Israel and Christians today. And while supplies last, the 13-part DVD set of the powerful series Messiah. Call the number on your screen now and become a monthly partner today. Join. 
So what was the outcome of the test when Daniel and his three friends refused to eat the king's food? Well, the answer is written plain in chapter 1 of Daniel, beginning in verse 18. Now, at the end of the days, mean the days of testing, when the king had said that they would be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Now, remember, this was a king who was known as a tyrant as well. He could be very cruel. He roasted his own officers over open fires. So, with his word, you could be killed on the spot. But notice what happens. Then the king interviewed them. He actually talked to them and engaged them in conversation, it, it would seem. Uh, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, these are their Hebrew given names. But their names are very interesting because here's what they mean. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means beloved of the Lord. Michelle means who is as God. And Azariah, the Lord is my help. Imagine naming your children with God's name within your children's names. In other words, linking them to God even with the name that they are given and will be known by for the rest of their lives. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar changed their names and gave them Babylonian names, but he could not change the nature of their hearts or their belief system about the Almighty God of Israel. But this was a wise king in other respects, if cruel at times. Because then we see in verse 20, and in all manners of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, these four, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Then Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus a time frame of some 70 years of exile in Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar to Cyrus the Great. And because of Daniel and who he was, and because he walked with God, he survived it all and served multiple empires. But he did it in the name of the God of Israel. Thanks for watching The Prophetic Connection and tune in next week for The King's Unsettling Dream. Mayor Panim is one of the charities that Christians for Israel Canada supports. Providing food and care through soup kitchens throughout the land of Israel, Mayor Panim has become a critical source for the most vulnerable. Yet the needs in many communities like Demona are rising. With the recent closure of two other soup kitchens in Demona, Mayor Panim must now expand to care for more people who are in desperate need. The demand on us has increased by at least 30 percent over the last year. Thanks to C4I's assistance, we are now going to expand the center and expand the amount of meals which will be going out every day. That is a C4I project and we're very, very grateful. Your giving makes a difference in the lives of Israel's most needy. Please help C4I, help Mir Panim, help people in Dimona. Call or write today and partner with us with a gift of just $20 or more and show the people of Israel that you care. We're waiting to hear from you.